Appeal court set aside tribunal judgment affirms Abdullahi Suley as Nasarawa governor. Gunmen kill one, abduct chief and seven others in Abuja. Bill to establish bitumen commission passes second reading in Senate. And away from Nigeria, Niger Junta sues ECOWAS court to rule December 7th. Hello and welcome to the news hour on Trust TV. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thanks for joining. The Court of Appeal in Abuja has reversed the judgment of Nasara State Governorship Election Tribunal, which sacked the incumbent governor, Abdullahi Sule, of the APC and declared David Ombogado authentic winner of the March 18 poll. Trust TV's political editor, Shafiu Suleiman, reports. The appellate court and its judgment on Thursday set aside the lower court ruling stressing that the appellant was denied fair hearing. In a unanimous judgment, the three-member panel led by Justice Uchechukwu Ongemenam reversed the nullification of the election of Governor Sule of the APC. The appellate court's decision is on the grounds that the tribunal wrongly relied on the evidence of eight of the witnesses that were produced by the PDP candidate whose statements and oath were not front-loaded alongside the petition. It also held that Section 205, Subsection 5 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, Section 132, Subsection 7 of the Electoral Act 2022, and Paragraphs 4, Subsection 5 and 6, and 14, Subsection 2 of the First Schedule to the Electoral Act, posits that every written statement on oath must be filed alongside the petition within the statutorily allocated time. The panel of justices held that the evidence of 12 remaining witnesses that testified for the PDP candidate were not sufficient to sustain the judgment of the tribunal after it struck out all the evidence and exhibits that were tendered before the tribunal by the eight witnesses. The appellate court in another breath held that the tribunal acted in error when it deducted a total of 1,868 votes that were accredited to Governor Sule on the premise that overvoting occurred in four polling units, even when the petitioners failed to provide necessary documents needed to prove overvoting. Dismissing the split judgment of the tribunal delivered on October 2nd, the court also vacated the order of the tribunal directing the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to withdraw the certificate of return issued to Governor Sule as it affirmed him as the winner of the governorship contest. In March 2023, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, declared Abdullahi Sule winner of the Nasarawa State Governorship election with 347,209 votes against David Umbogadu of the PDP, who scored 283,016 votes. Thank God for the judgments just delivered. They were well considered. Out of all the judgments that were delivered, I think today we we'll say it was 4-0. It was rather a very strange misconception of the case. And happily, this is not the final court in this matter. We already have instructions to test the decisions that have been rendered this afternoon, and we have already swung into action. We've gone into a game, and in the game, I'll be a winner and I'll be a loser. And of course, you don't expect the loser to celebrate. And I understand the way they feel, and um, the most understand, I must first of all have a state before I can have a government. It was kind of like here, outside the Court of Appeal premises, uh, with uh, supporters across party lines, cheering their candidates to victory. Uh, this is a suit that has generated a lot of uh, interest on the side of uh, supporters of both parties, that is the supporters of the incumbent governor Abdullah Sule of the APC and that of uh, David Mbugadu of the People's Democratic Party. From the Court of Appeal premises here in Abuja, Shapiro Suleiman, Trust TV News. Milwa reactions have continued to trail Thursday's appeal court judgment that reaffirmed Governor Abdullahi Sule's victory in the 2023 Nasarawa State Governorship election. Trust TV had on October 2 reported the annulment of Governor Sule's victory and subsequent declaration of his opponent, the People's Democratic Party's candidate David Umbogado, as winner. Abubakar Abdullahi sent in the report 
as presented from our studio. Since after the election of March 18, 2023, the fight to determine who actually won the governorship seat of Nasra State shifted to the courtroom where the People's Democratic Party's candidate, David Umbugadu, who lost the election, filed a petition at the election petition tribunal in Lafia. After arguing for and against by councils representing Umbugadu PDP, Governor Sule APC, and the Independent National Electoral Commission, the tribunal, in a split judgment of 2 to 1, nullified the victory of, the, of Governor Sule and declared Umbugadu of PDP as the winner of the election. Dissatisfied with the judgment, Governor Sully filed an appeal challenging the tribunal majority ruling and the appeal court in its unanimous judgment held that the tribunal was wrong to have recalculated the votes of the parties and determined that Ombugado of the PDP won the Nasrallah state governorship election held on March 18, 2023, when the entire evidence of Ombugado and the PDP were inadmissible and cases. Residents of the state have been reacting differently to the appeal court judgment with some still claiming that the PDP candidate won the election. We know from the beginning we won the election. We know at the tribunal we won the election. At the appeal court we won the election. And whosoever court that is really will choose to take us to, we will still win the election. Because if you check the IRF, the result is clear. And we have won, outrightly won. Nobody can tell us we didn't win. And there is nothing we detect us or to, we scared us. To, 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 to fear although to, to, in any way to say we, we didn't want an election. Until tomorrow, next tomorrow, forever, I'm still saying that we won the election. Other residents welcomed the judgment and expressed satisfaction with the court's decision. Court, the ASLA has won the case, so we are very, very, very grateful. And we know everything is for God. Anything God has given somebody, nobody will say no. So we are very happy. They are, I want to call the attention of sons and daughters of Nasrawa State to come out and celebrate engineer Abdullahi A. A. Sule, to come out and support engineer Abdullahi A. A. Sule for the success of his administration. After the judgment of the Abuja Division of the Court of Appeal on Nasrawa State Governorship Election, Trust TV observed that security agencies have increased their presence in the state as personnel and vehicles have been stationed at strategic locations while patrols are taking place across the state. In a similar vein, the Court of Appeal in Abuja has affirmed the judgment of the Gombe State Governorship Election Tribunal, which dismissed the petition filed by the People's Democratic Party challenging the re-election of Governor Inoua Yahaya of the All Progressives Congress. Delivering judgment on Thursday, the court agreed with the tribunal that the PDP's case lacked merit. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEG, had on March 18 announced Governor Yahya of the APC, winner of the governorship election with 342,821 votes. Mohamed Jibrin Baradei of the People's Democratic Party was said to have scored 233,131. Baradei had approached the tribunal insisting that the election of the governor did not comply with the provisions of the Electoral Act. His lawyers maintain that the PDP candidates scored majority of the lawful votes cast during the poll, alleging that multiple tom printing and ballot box stuffing took place in nine local government areas of the state in favor of Governor Inua Yahya. However, the three-man panel of the tribunal dismissed the PDP's application for lacking in merit. What the judgment has just affirmed is to give approval to the decision of the people of Gombe as expressed with their votes on the 18th of March. Yes, we have just uh, received the judgment. We listened to Sale here. We will uh, consider the judgment when we get the copy, certified true copy of the judgment seek advice of our advice our client on the next step in respect of the matter the conclusion part of it is that the court dismissed our appeal that we still have rights to appeal for the appeal to the appeal court very happy and elated is a confirmation of what the people of gombe state did the elections in gombe as testified to by INEC and the observers was very peaceful it was free it was fair it was devoid of any kind of rank or anything 
the people of Gombe State came out and voted a mass for the people's governor, Alaji Mahmoud Inu Ayaya. And what the court has just did today is to, is to affirm what the people of Gombe State did. Now, as controversy continued to trail the certified true copy of the judgment of the Court of Appeal, which sacked Governor Abba Yusuf of Kano State, stakeholders from the APC in the state have raised alarm over a planned violent protest by members of the new Nigeria People's Party in the state. Addressing a news conference at the headquarters of the party in Abuja, the Director General of Gauna Garu Campaign Organization, Rabiu Suleiman Bichi, alleged that NNPP members are planning to attack key APC members on Saturday, November 25, during a mass protest. The party called on the Kano State Police Command and other security agencies to be alive to their responsibilities of protecting lives and property. Suleiman Bichi, who noted that members of the APC are law-abiding citizens and as such will not do anything to disturb peace, however said that they will not hesitate to protect their lives and belongings in the event of an attack. In the meantime, operatives of the Police and Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, NSCDC, on Thursday prevented the new Nigeria People's Party supporters in the state from observing a special prayer session at Feeling Mahaha. Now, Trust TV reports that there was an outrage that led to a clash between the supporters and the police shortly after they observed a similar activity on Wednesday evening. The supporters had taken to the streets in a solidarity march demanding justice in the certified true copy of the appeal court judgment in Kano governorship election Tosu. But on Thursday, when the supporters were out again to gain access to the feeling Mahaha, they were greeted by teams of armed police and NSCDC operatives who denied them access. Staying with political matters, the Labour Party governorship candidate in Imo State, Ethan Achonu, on Thursday led his supporters to protest the, outcoming, the outcome of the November 11 poll at the national headquarters of the Independent National Electoral Commission in Abuja. Two weeks ago, the electoral body declared Governor Hopu Zodima of the All Progressives Congress winner of the election. Now, the results have since been rejected by the LP and the People's Democratic Party, who alleged that the exercise was marred by irregularities. According to INEC, Uzodima polled 540,308 votes to beat Samuel Anyao of the People's Democratic Party, who scored 71,503 votes, while Achonu could only secure 64,000 and 84 votes. But leading his supporters to the INEC headquarters, the protesters demanded the certified true copies of the election results it con conducted in Imo State. The LP supporters alleged that the results announced by the commission are different from what INEC has on its server. Moving on now to security matters. Gunmen said to be numbering about 30 on Wednesday night attacked Pape community in Buari Area Council in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. The incident led to the killing of one resident and abduction of eight others. The report. Residents who spoke to Trust TV said the kidnappers came into the area around 9 p.m on Wednesday attacking about six different houses including the palace of the chief of the community, Peter David, who was among the eight abducted persons. His sister-in-law, Josephine David, gave detailed account of how the incident took place. For this place is a palace, his royal highness, Zaki Wanjiare, Serkefili, so he's a family to me, that's my brother-in-law. So that last night, my house is down there quite all right. So immediately we heard what happened. I was, I was disturbed quite all right, but I don't know that they were involved. It was this morning that I find out that they were not around and they invaded the house. So we came in, we saw the doors, the rooms, everywhere was turned upside down. Both his palace is turned upside down. 
So we have been trying the line throughout yesterday. It wasn't going through till this very morning. One of the residents, Shegun Jimo, was shot dead by the gunmen who divided themselves into groups. Kayode Ogun is a guardian to the deceased. So I was called that my wife called me that so something is happening in the environment. I say, where is this? Where is my uh, where is my people? What if everybody is around? They say no, except Shegu. They didn't know they did not know where about of Shegu. I say, ah, what? Immediately they called me again that Shegu, they have shot Shegu die at up there. Because Shegu hear that a small picking is crying inside the bush there, over there. He won't go there to rush and rescue the baby from there. He was attacked, it's gone. Two residents, Chinwe Wozo, and another lady who simply gave her name as Chichi, were among those that escaped the abduction by the whiskers. They gave further details about how the attackers got to their respected homes and abducted one person each from their homes. My brother, they packed my, my, uh, my guy's shoe. They, even my money, they bogged everywhere, all the rooms, collected money, collected shoes, um, carried everything, like the thing they could touch, and then they now carried the boy together. The guy is a mature guy, around 31 or so. So next, 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 I saw some people there, they were like knocking. So in my mind, I thought maybe it's the people that are the boys that normally work for him. Because some of them do sleep in it. So when I stood outside, then I said, so let me go inside and lock door. And then I would see some men coming. So then I went inside because everywhere is lonely. So I went inside. I locked the door when I was locking this door. So I was kind of hearing their voices. I asked my mom that she should not talk that some people are coming inside. I don't know who they are. The attackers also shot another resident who was rushed to an undisclosed hospital in Abuja where he was receiving medical attention. Now worried by the recent rise in kidnappings in the nation's capital, the Senate has called on the FCT minister, Yesom Wike, to revisit the failed $500 million contract awarded in 2009 for the installation of CCTV cameras in Abuja and its environs. The Senate also wants the executive to install CCTV cameras in strategic locations across the 36 states to forestall incidences of kidnapping and other criminal activities across the country. The report. These resolutions, among others, were reached during Wednesday's plenary following a debate on a motion presented on the floor by the Senator representing Delta North Ned Ngoko. In his lead debate, Ngoko expressed concern over the kidnapping incident in Galadimao area of Abuja, where 19 people were forcefully taken from their homes, including his senior legislative aide, Chris Agidi. He further noted that out of the 19 individuals kidnapped, 12 are feared dead while efforts to ascertain the well-being of the remaining seven victims are ongoing. Deeply worried that the Failure to urgently address the kidnapping crisis in Nigeria, especially in um, FCT, could result in social unrest, loss of confidence in governance, humanitarian toll, economic decline, increased insecurity, and potential international implications, all of which could profoundly impact the nation's stability, prosperity, and international standing. Contributing to the debate, Senators Enyi Naya Abaribe and Adamu Alero noted that the security situation in Abuja has hit an all-time high as most people can no longer sleep in their homes for fear of being attacked. So many citizens no longer sleep in their homes. They run into town and go back during the day. So there's something very, very serious going on in around the federal capital territory. No matter what we say, this is the capital territory of Nigeria. If there's anywhere that's going to be seen as very secure, this ought to be the most secure place in Nigeria. Now that it seems that uh, the same lackadaisical attitude to security is being taken to, all of us are at risk. Mr. President, FCT is home for everybody. That's why everybody is now coming into FCT to stay because of relative security compared to other places 
uh, in the 36 states of federation. This is the seat of government. This is the, where the diplomats are staying. It is embarrassing. It's a national shame and disgrace for us to have this kind of thing. So the security agent must be up to task. And we must ginger them to do the needful. The Senate leadership therefore called on the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Ebetokun, to increase patrol around the FCT and other parts of the country to curb the worrisome trend. Troops of the Joint Task Force Northwest Operation Hader and Daji have killed four terrorists in Zamfara State during a coordinated clearance operations. The clearance operations was conducted at some identified terrorist hideouts at Tazami, Mashema, uh, Gandaya, Maji, Doka villages and surrounding forest in Gandaya village of Bungudu local government area of the state. The spokesperson of the operation Hadar Indaji, Captain Yahya Ibrahim, who disclosed in a statement on Thursday, also said an unconfirmed number of terrorists escaped with gunshot wounds in the latest clearance operation. You're watching the News Hour on Trust TV. Coming up shortly. Delta residents decry growing moral decadence. Details and more after the break. We started manufacturing leather since 1958. But the most important thing is that if the system is checked correctly, we won't, we won't have where we are now. If somebody has depression, they may just be very irritable and unproductive in the office. So you find on average already about one in four, one in five Nigerians already have a mental illness, a mental health condition that needs some form of attention. Uh, no matter how good an economy is, if the federal government goes past, believe me, everything in that economy is just a matter of time to go past. Uh, so first of all, about uh, maybe slightly above, below 70% is in federal government securities. If government has uh, banned importation of fertilizer and states are doing it at the level of governance, but I believe that production and distribution of fertilizer should be left to the private sector. Uh, this is the general multipurpose card and it has a chip here. So this chip is about 80 kilobytes. The one that you get from the bank for ATM is just 4 kilobytes. So this is like 20, 20 times. Why did you develop this reputation as somebody who is difficult to <laughs> work with? I will tell the truth. Mm. No matter whose ox is worn, I will say exactly how it is. This is where I actually sympathize with commissioners of nowadays. Mm. Where a commissioner sometimes is just a picture. You find somebody, even a cleaner, and the governor's wife can interfere with their, with their abilities. Even the ministers, there are very many who respected me simply because I never complained about them. I never went to ask for a favor, uh, never. So none of that has happened? Nothing. But it, 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 if it hasn't happened, do you have hope that now the, another government coming in? There is no hope. So you have given up on, I've, I've on given politics? I've given up. Politics. It's gone, it's gone. Retrenchment from work is the most hated thing by unions. It's a loss of job. Uh, means that is loss of life, in fact, for, for civil servants at that time. Nigeria's economy, Nigeria's security, Nigeria's intelligence, this is what the materials we were handling. And I thought government would be very interested. The reasons why you adopted federalism is not because of finesse, not because you like it, it's because of its functional utility.
Welcome back. You're watching the news uh, on Trust TV. Here's a reminder of our top stories. Appeal court set aside tribunal judgment affirms Abdullahi Sule as Nasarawa governor. Gunmen kill one, abduct chief and seven others in Abuja. President Bola Tinubu has approved the appointment of Ambassador Desmond Akawo to serve as a federal commissioner in the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission. The confirmation is subject to the approval of the Senate, according to a statement by the presidential spokesman, Ajuri Ingilali, on Thursday. The new federal commissioner, who represents River State, is being appointed following the tragic demise of the immediate past federal commissioner from River State, Asondu Wena Temple, earlier this month. Prior to the latest appointment, Akao served in various capacities as Nigeria's ambassador to South Korea and Minister of State, Federal Capital Territory. He also served as the sole administrator of the Greater Port, Greater Potaka Development Authority and Chief Executive Officer of the Niger Delta River Basin, uh, Basin uh, Development Authority and also the Executive Director of the Nigerian Port Authority. Uh, engineering and technical services. The establishment of a bitumen commission is underway as the Nigerian Senate this Thursday passed the bill for second reading. Sponsor of the bill, Jimo Ibrahim, said that the piece of legislation seeks to provide a legal framework for the promotion of research, study and exploration development and utilization of locally sourced bitumen in Nigeria. The report. In his lead debate, the Ondo South Senator Jimo Ibrahim explained that the investment on bitumen is of immense benefit to Nigeria, being a $147 billion industry. He observed that the only way Nigeria could maximize the bitumen potential is to establish a commission to become one of five countries in the world that currently explore bitumen. Senator Ibrahim knows that the product has the potential to serve as new oil in Nigeria. Even if we are to borrow money to develop bitumen today, there is no legal framework. So nobody can borrow us money when there is no any law. Even if we are to develop it and bring international skill, there is no law. We don't have any law. There is nothing can develop without law. Other lawmakers in their contributions stress the need for economic diversification of the country in view of its mineral deposits, which has remained largely untapped citing bitumen as one of such mineral deposits. The bill is all about drawing attention to an important area that has been neglected, an area that has a potential of earning $110 billion. Bitumen is critical not only to the road network, but to the economic growth of Nigeria. The idea of a commission solely for bitumen, however, did not go down with, with some lawmakers for reasons personal to them. I have difficulties in accepting that the creation of a commission will by itself lead to exploration of uh, bitumen. Bitumen is nothing but heavy oil. Therefore, I do not think that it is outside the remit of the Petroleum Act. The bill nonetheless scaled to second reading and has since been referred to the Senate Committee on Solid Minerals. The committee is to report back in two weeks for further legislative inputs. Having read this bill for the second time, it is now referred to the Committee on Solid Minerals to report back to the Senate in two weeks. If the proposed legislation scales through both in chambers of the National Assembly and consequently a bitumen development commission is established after presidential assent, it will be the first law on exploration development and thereafter export promotion for bitumen in Nigeria. Rashidat Yusuf for Trust TV News. At the Green Chamber, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Abbas Tajuddin, has stated that Nigeria must avoid more wasteful years since the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has been commercialized and profit-oriented. 
Speaker Abbas stated this when the management of the NNPC are led by the group chief executive officer Mele Kari paid him a curtsy visit on Thursday. Abbas called for measures to turn around the losses suffered by the economy due to the non-productive state of the nation's refineries by privatizing them for better management and productivity. Earlier, the group chief executive officer, NNPCL Mele Kari, said that the company has recorded several successes owing to the use of the provisions of the Petroleum Industry Act. In a related development, Speaker of the House of Representatives Tajuddin Abbas has disclosed that over 300,000 barrels of crude oil per day are estimated to be lost in the country due to, the, to, due to theft, vandalism and other criminal activities. Abbas disclosed this in Abuja during his remarks at the inauguration of the House Special Committee on Crude Oil Theft. The report. The speaker noted that some of the severe consequences of the crude oil theft to the nation include revenue loss, environmental disaster, threats to regional peace and security, proliferation of arms and a poor investment climate. The speaker lamented that the nation is reported to incur losses of oil revenues estimated at 1.29 trillion naira annually due to industrial scale theft. He therefore reminded the committee of its primary objective, which is to determine the remote causes of oil theft and recommend remedial measures to the House. Revenue generating agencies must ensure transparency in the management of generated revenues. Let me state clearly that the House will not tolerate low performance by agencies or failure to show evidence of required remittances to the federation accounts. We shall also closely monitor and undertake strict oversight of the activities of all revenue generating agencies to ensure compliance. The chairman of the House Special Committee on Crude Oil Theft, Al Hassan Dogua, lamented that the country is yet to tap into its natural resources due to crude oil theft. He expressed concern that most of the recommendations aimed at tackling crude oil theft in the country are left in the shelves or attended to. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, oil theft is large-scale illegal business estimated to be worth 133 billion US dollars per year globally, which makes it the world's biggest theft of a natural resource and is also considered to be the number one most smuggled natural resources globally. Recall that the Thand House resolved at plenary to tackle one of the large threats to Nigeria's economy, which is crude oil theft. State Governor Babagana Zulum says his government will enhance agricultural activities and create avenues for trans-border trade between the state and Chad. This, the governor said, will boost the economic life of the state and propel it to greater heights. Trust TV's Beatrice Kuruti reports. The governor who ferried over the Baga side of the Lake Chad Basin noted that communities that have returned after insurgency would be given livelihood support and humanitarian aid as well as encourage them to venture into large-scale farming. The governor also approved the construction of a new mega-sized higher Islamic college in Baga town. He said the 2000 student capacity school will combine traditional Islamic education with literacy, numeracy, digital and vocational education. So our first ambition is to see how we shall support the Nigerian and the previous command, how we shall support the naval base Baga here to clear the waterways, water heights and other grasses that are in the lake. It's two years when we came, we found not more than 100 pupils in the school, but now you can see up to about 1,500, 2,000 pupils are, are in the school. So this is an, uh, uh, an improvement over the past. So, and then we have recruited new teachers, you have seen them. Uh, 
what I shall do now is to see how we shall add more teachers. In another development, the Borno state government has distributed 275 million naira cash, food and other items to 95,000 residents of Mongono town in Mongono local government area of the state. During the distribution, 55,000 women were each given 5,000 naira cash and a wrapper, while 40,000 male heads of household received 25 kg of rice and 10 kg of beans. Munguno, which was displaced by Boko Haram insurgents about eight years ago before it was recaptured by the Nigerian military, hosts IDPs from four local government areas, namely Kukawa, Guzamala, Nganze, and Marte. The state governor, Babagana Zulum, at the distribution exercise said the palliative distribution will continue throughout his tenure in order to support communities severely affected by Boko Haram insurgency. He expressed gratitude to President Bola Tinibu and Vice President Kashim Shetima for supporting Borno state government with rise through the Northeast Development Commission. Still from Bruno State, Governor Babagana Zulum have directed the construction of about four kilometer road network at Federal Polytechnic, Mungunu. The governor ordered the allocation of a building owned by Borno State Government for use as a hostel by the Polytechnic. Zulum directed that the road construction be executed in phases with the first phase to commence in January next year. He gave the directive during a visit to the permanent site of the Polytechnic, which is under construction in Mongono town. Meanwhile, Governor Babagana Zulum has approved the release of 20 million naira to the specialist hospital Mongono for the hospital's management to cater for the hospital's immediate needs. Zulum also ordered an incentive package to be distributed to all staff who had reported to work at the time of his visit in order to motivate them. I want to comment to the director of the hospital management board. I also want to comment the Minister of Medical Officer and all that are in Medical and Paramedical staff that are working here. In order to comment this, I provide the share of our duty to get that So that we can identify some of the major challenges. Now, the lack of basic social amenities like roads, hospitals, and educational institutions has become a source of concern for most rural settlements in Benue State. The absence of these basic facilities has resulted to mass migration of young people from rural areas to urban settings. According to Jimmy Azande, who filed in this report, this mass migration is a major setback to the rural economy. According to rural dwellers in many settlements, no one has ever seen a hygienic water source within their communities. Hence, they are restricted to available sources, which in most cases are not healthy. There is lack of potable water in our village. The water source is a river, and it is contaminated and not good for consumption. I am a food vendor, and my major challenge is portable water. This is negatively affecting my. Our farm settlements are quite a distance. Same way we go looking for water. Sometimes we go hungry for lack of water. The absence of health facilities and electricity, they also said, is the reason why many prefer to migrate to urban settlements like Makodi. The distance we go in search of health facilities 
has caused many avoidable deaths. We hope someday someone will come to our rescue. <laughs> I travel far away to recharge my clippers for the head court business. Without electricity, my business is suffering setbacks. This is the reason why many people choose to, to live in town than live in villages. Yes, my Opinion experts and policy analysts opine that granting local government autonomy is the only way development can reach rural communities. And uh, if you go through uh, around the country, you will agree that uh, the third year of government is not functioning at all. Uh, so I think that is my view concerning that there's no autonomy now. So if at the end of the day, the uh, houses of assembly are able to uh, vote uh, in favor of that proposal, then the local government autonomy will be granted. I think it will be better off for it. Residents of Benue said the practice over the years has been one in which politicians listen to the demands of the rural dwellers during campaigns. Lamenting that once they are in government, no one remembers the conspicuous infrastructural deficits, which is a catalyst for rural to urban migration in Benue State. Jimmy Azandi, Trust TV News, Makodi. Nigeria is struggling with a growing moral decadence as social cultural value systems face persistent erosion due to international influence. The cultural mode of dressing has been largely diminished as residents in Delta State call for a turnaround with a view to addressing indecency among young Nigerians. From Asaba, Jonathan Awaye completes the report. Nigeria has become a melting pot of global ideas and values that often comes with negative consequences. That growing influence of media and how it shapes the lives of people have been largely responsible for decadence in Nigeria society today. While social shifts happen from generation to generation, the pervasive nature of dressing among youths have given residents cause to worry. Indecent dressing that has ravaged our youth today is Western, I mean Westernization. Let me put it that way. These people, our people here, uh, Nigerians, you know we are good in copying bad things. It has gone a long way. This is the same dressing. It has gone a long way. Because if you watch most of our boys, uh, the youth, let me see, out of watching films, if not, this sagging of Raza goes to the what they do in America in those days, the prisoners. Because you know when they lose their bet, the trousers will sag. So that is just the major thing. That's why the prisoners, that's their dressing. But I wonder why I use when I say making use of those kind of dressing. I call a guy. Actually, it's not supposed to be African culture. That declining moral standards in some Nigerian communities has impacted negatively on the productivity of youth. And some say parental and institutional guidance can mitigate the dangerous trend by gatekeeping immoral and indecent behavior. Mothers should help their girl child to educate them to dress well and they look neat and look decent so that they will see good husband to, to marry. Because any person not well dressed will not see any good husband. They will marry their type. And marry their type, what type, what type of children will they give back to? They will give back to the same. Uh, to wear to certain occasions because, for instance, you can't be sagging you know, or wearing red jeans and be going to church. It's not right, it's not proper, it's not allowed. Or you can't be wearing mini skirts and go for all these occasions like marriages or conventions. And it's not right and it's really not something that you'd have to give yourself a name for, for something like that. Like they said, um, dress the way you want to be addressed. It's good, you don't need to be expensively dressed to be decently dressed. All you need to do is just to cover the vital parts of a woman's body. A woman needs respect, dignity. The way you carry yourself determines the way you are dressed. The way you dress is the way you will be addressed. Therefore, children should learn to dress moderately and parents should encourage their children to dress properly and not uh, indecently because it will give the family a very bad name. In the school, 
uh, it is uh, very very common to find school children cut their own dress that have been sewn according to the school style. While many youths consider their mode of dressing a fashion trend, the phenomenon, if left unchecked, could undermine the integrity of Nigeria's social fabric. Jonathan Awaye, Trust TV News, Asaba. Time now to take a short break. More news continues shortly. Human beings know what is right. If they don't want to do what is right, they will give you 1,001 reasons why they are doing the wrong things. So they see themselves as conquerors and other people have been conquered. When the, when the opposition and the, the press keep parroting that phrase, government has failed, government has failed, but if, we will not be here, hold on, mm. we will not be here, sitting down here, if government has failed. There, there has been almost a total collapse of the security of the And the terrorists have taken advantage of this. Me on that. A country that has about 923 square kilometer of arable land. Not more than 2.5% has been cultivated. Of course, you, the Nigerian citizen, will also have your say via our phone in numbers on your screen. The issue of uh, appointment in Nigeria has become more political than doing the right thing for the country. Thanks for staying with us. It's now time to take a look at Business Update with Chiamaka Mwafo. The Rural Electrification Agency, REA, has commissioned an energy management system control centre capable of hosting all mini-grids in the country. Speaking during the launch at its headquarters in Abuja, the Managing Director of REA, Ahmed Ahmed said the project, which was done in partnership with the Korean Energy Project, sought to establish an integrated energy management system capable of hosting all mini grids in the country and four standalone mini grids on electrified areas around the federal capital territory. Ahmed stated that other auxiliary productive use of the equipment included smart metering, energy efficient lighting and water systems among others as part of the intervention. Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa and other countries of the UN have voted to take a greater role in international tax matters in the move that threatens the ascendancy of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, the body that has led these discussions for decades. Developing nations have been pushing for a greater UN role after growing frustration at global tax negotiations coordinated by the Paris-based OECD. In 2021, more than 130 countries agreed on a landmark deal aimed at curbing corporate tax avoidance by multinationals. But developing countries have complained they will receive relatively little revenue from the reforms compared with richer nations. Last year, 54 African countries successfully brought a resolution at the UN General Assembly which recommended that the UN Secretary General produces a report assessing ways to strengthen the inclusiveness and effectiveness of international tax cooperation. Oil prices sank further on Thursday after the shock decision by OPEC Plus to delay a key policy meeting suggesting fresh discord in the bloc. Stock markets, meanwhile, traded mixed after two U.S. reports dented recent ethereum over the future of interest rates. Both main crude contracts lead on news that the much-anticipated gathering of OPEC Plus and alliance of major producers led by Saudi Arabia and Russia will be put back by four days to November 30th. Prices declined by another 1% on Thursday, having died by almost 5% at one point on Wednesday following the news. 
Reports said the decision was made after Angola and Nigeria pushed back against low attackers that were urged by others, with Saudi Arabia said to have been preparing to extend a 1 million barrel a day output court into the new year. Riyadh and Moscow unveiled massive cuts earlier this year in a bid to boost prices which have come under pressure owing to stuttering economies in the United States, Europe and particularly China. And away from Nigeria, Niger Republic Junta, led by General Abdurrahman Chiani, has sued authorities of the head of state and government of the Economic Community of West African State over sanctions levied by the West African bloc on the country following the takeover of power by the military. The coup leaders ask ECOWAS court to immediately lift the sanctions imposed on them by their West African neighbors. Consequently, ECOWAS court during its session in Abuja on Monday set December 7, 2023 to pass its judgment on the case. The applicants, represented by their lawyers, Mukaila Yai and five other lawyers, argued that the sanctions imposed by the ECOWAS were extremely stringent and targeted at Nigerians. And the respondents, ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State, the Mediation and Security Council, and the ECOWAS Commission, represented by Francois Kanga, a penant, argued that the junta is not recognized under the bloc's protocol and does not have the power to institute such a case in court. Ambulances were on standby Thursday as Indian rescuers dug through the final meters of debris, separating them from 41 workers trapped in a collapsed road tunnel for nearly two weeks. Rescue teams have specially fitted stretchers with wheels ready to pull the exhausted men out through 57 meters of steel pipe once it is driven through the final section of the tones of earth, concrete and rubble blocking their escape. Emergency vehicles and a field hospital stood ready, preparing to receive the men who have been trapped since a portion of the under construction tunnel in the Himalayan state of Uttarakhand caved in 12 days ago. Now, but rescue efforts have been hit with repeated delays, including more debris falling, fears of further cavings and drilling machine breakdowns as progress on Thursday was slowed by further mechanical problems. Now, Uttarakhand Chief Minister Pushkar Singh uh, Dami said that the work was on a war footing with a team of doctors ambulances, helicopters, and a field hospital setup. And in sports news, Super Eagles forward Taiwo Awoni has been ruled out for months following a groin injury and risk missing Nigeria's outing at the delayed Africa Cup of Nations build for early next year. The striker picked up the injury in Nigeria's 1-1 draw with Lesotho in a Group C qualification game for the 2026 World Cup. Awoni 26 has been instrumental for Forest this season. Already, the 26-year-old has four Premier League goals in 10 matches. Let's now take a look at more sports updates with Adeni Adishafe. Companies seeking to acquire broker's rights of the Nigerian Premier Football League have been invited to approve the league body with offers for negotiation. MPFL chairman Bengai Legbeleye clarified that the adopted marketing approach of the board is for non-exclusivity, which has not foreclosed the signing up of more rights holders. The MPFL secured two broker's partners for the over-the-top OTT platform and for the direct-to-home DTH cable platform. And still on MPFL, clubs in the Nigerian Premier Football League have been advised to curb a number of conduct of their coaches, players and ball boys during fixtures. Regulating match day conduct of coaches, players and ball boys, MPFL Chief Operating Officer David Stinowumi reminded MPFL clubs that relevant provisions of MPFL framework and rules will be
be invoked to ensure no individual or group demean the public perception of the league. A memo issued to clubs drawing attention to dress code of coaches categorized as appearing for matches in inappropriate apparels that portray the entire league in the bad light, with such coaches tagged based on relevant provision of rules. MPFL also frowned at hiding match balls by ball boys of home teams for undue advantage through time wasting when the ball is out of play. MPFM updated match commissioners and independent secret assessors to eradicate the disappearance act of ball boys with balls to the advantage of home teams in the course of a match. Match commissioners have been issued a new practice direction of ensuring that the numbers of ball boys and balls remain the same as it was at the start of the match. Match commissioners are henceforth at liberty to ask the referee to add every minute wasted by this disreputable conduct as MPFL would not hesitate to impose appropriate sanctions on offending clubs. That's Sport News. I'm Adeni Akinshafe. That wraps up the news hour for tonight. But you can watch more via all our social media platforms and also on our YouTube live stream. I am Ayuba. Ilya, thanks for watching. From the Daily Trust News Center, this is the News Hour.